tell everybody, you know, when you're when you're planning a, a semester long series of programming on the desert, your dream is to include someone whose voice and outlook perfectly captures the essence of that strange and captivating landscape. And I am accordingly delighted to be able to welcome to the Humanities Centre the writer and broadcaster Ken Lane, proprietor of the truly great periodical and radio programme, Desert Oracle. Uh, born in New Orleans and raised in Phoenix, Ken Lane was a pioneer in the field of internet journalism before rejecting that whole culture and what he's called, I quote brilliantly, the numbing horror of social media and the digital age and relocating around 15 years ago to Joshua Tree. From this base, he began producing Desert Oracle, which disseminated marvelous tales of the desert concerning lost hikers, UFOs, the animals and plants of the Mojave, legendary creatures such as Yucca Man, and the remarkable human denizens of the desert from Edward Abbey and William Burroughs to Marta Beckett and Marty Robbins. Throughout all of this, Lane writes of the desert, the desert, our wild paradise, he says, the kingdom of heaven, writes about this with great attention and love. The desert, Lane writes, and I quote, is wilderness stripped bare, and when left alone, is creation in perfection. The landscape is vast and visible, the geology raw and exposed, the plants and animals in ideal proportion. Now the memorable stories of Desert Oracle are told via 44 page quarterly periodicals and a late night radio show, uh, the full auditory experience of which is unique and utterly compelling. I'm also to say, I'm sorry, I'm also happy to say that copies of the first compilation of these stories dedicated, the book is, to the good people who love and protect the desert wilderness. Copies of this book are available for purchase from our good friends at Warwick's Books. Thank you, John. And uh, It was one of your colleagues, uh, Adrian, who is here, who first pressed enthusiastically a copy of this book into my hand and having it with me uh, transformed a trip I subsequently took to Joshua Tree. I cannot recommend this book highly enough, so please uh, get yourself a copy, do yourself a favor. Uh, anyway, that's enough from me. Uh, please welcome uh, the voice of the desert, Ken. Thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, Warwicks, for coming. There's nothing that makes me happier than seeing a book I had something to do with on the on the Warwick's Instagram, which already uh, voids the whole anti-social media thing. So I uh, I apologize for the hypocrisy. There will be more to come. Let's see, how can we do this? I'll hold it if it's not too annoying. Thank you all. Um, it's lovely to be here. I've been to USD before. It's been a while, but it's, uh, it's always nice to be somewhere that was deliberately designed to be beautiful and inspiring. And it was most of the campus was built, what, in the late 20th century? Mid late. Um, and it's, that's not how Southern California architecture usually looks. Although, although the, uh, the vulgarized image remains in our, our tract houses. For the past eight years, I've uh, published a sort of guidebook on the subject that you all have been spending time on this year, desert landscapes, and specifically how these landscapes affect and are interpreted by uh, humans, by the human imagination. Some people move to the middle of nowhere to 
study the animals, to study the plants, to study the rocks, uh, to study the other people who have moved to the middle of nowhere. For me, is is all of the above, and also a kind of long term experiment on myself for. The past 25 years, um, half my life, if I leave off a few years, I've lived in the Mojave or the Great Basin or the Sonoran Desert by choice, mostly. I've tried to build a functioning reality that accommodates the handful of things that I've figured out make life more or less bearable for me. Uh, daily walks in the wilderness, lots of reading, too much typing, and the two forms of media that uh, still have resonance for myself and I think for uh, a lot of people, which are printed books and uh, terrestrial radio radio that you pick up in your car because you don't have a cell phone signal and you can't listen to anything you'd like to listen to and you have to search the dial and you have to go through all the religious stations and then all the public radio stations that just barely come in because it's not really worth it to broadcast to the middle of nowhere in the desert because and during the pledge time, um, there aren't a lot of people calling in. And then when you get to the very end of the dial, there's a community station in the high desert where I live that plays, I'm not sure what the format is called. It's uh, AAC, I think, Adult Something Contemporary. And it's just, it's, uh, no one seems to like the music much. So they just kind of skip through it. But late at night, they run strange things. And I'm lucky that uh, I was able to talk uh, my way into the station. So if you're driving up to Joshua Tree, which I want to suggest right now because the, the tourists are kind of heavy. Um, 107.7 FM at the right end of the dial. If you don't get Desert Oracle, you'll get another weird local show. And you'll think, you know, who who let these people on the radio? And that's the the feeling that I like to get when I listen to the radio. Uh as we get to the end of uh what I'm doing here today, um, we will do, I think, some questions and discussion. Um, that chair is for someone and they did not come with me. So um, don't don't let it distract or worry you for now. Also, we're going to do very manual slide progression. Uh, because that's that's what the technology wanted. And it's less disruptive, I think. This is a picture of a place that's called the Old Black Mailbox. And you can see from the white mailbox there that it's been painted since it got that name. This is as close as you can legally get to Area 51 in your car. You park at the end of that road and you walk up to a hill that's been named Freedom Ridge by the people who like to go spy on what's going on down there. And you can sometimes see these strange things. Um, some people believe that there's a, uh, a secret program uh, to backwards engineer uh, uh, alien spaceships there. Um, that's That has not been proven. 
But there's one guy who's made a living off of it for 30 years named Bob Lazar, uh, who has had a hit Netflix documentary about him. He got a book deal. He had a book come out uh, on uh, a publishing imprint owned by San Diego's own uh, Tom DeLong from... Thank you. Thank you. He... Yes. So he's he's moved up in the world. Uh, has he's a publisher now. Two quotes from enduringly popular sources that bring the moody desert landscape right to your mind wherever you are. One is I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Uh, John one twenty three, from the Bible. You have to clarify that sometimes. And I also had someone come up to me when I repeated that quote once and said, uh, did the guy who said that, uh, was he the writer of the book? I said, I don't think so. As if, if the story is to be believed, he kind of lost his head, you know. Um, there's another John, common name. The other quote from a, a equally beloved source is, Poncho met his match, you know, on the deserts down in Mexico. And that's from the song Poncho and Lefty by the late great Texas songwriter Towns Van Zant. And now and then I'll hear that song, usually the version done by Amy Lou Harris. And you just hear that line about this character with the enigmatic name who, who met his match on the deserts, which is an old way of saying in the desert when people referred to it as, as being at sea, as how alien it seemed to the land that especially European Americans were used to on the deserts down in Mexico. Both of those doomed characters, John the Baptist and the mysterious Poncho, are exactly the kind of romantic outlaws who belong in the desert wilderness. And I say desert wilderness a lot because often when people say desert these days, they mean something else. Desert wilderness has inspired cultures and religions, prophets and poets, and quite a few outlaws going back to the earliest human civilizations. Wilderness is the original meaning of desert. And like so many romantic words, the scientists have kind of taken it away and stripped it of the romance. It was a term of mystery, desert, that has become uh, a word describing a certain minimal amount of precipitation, of rainfall. But the word wilderness, in the case of the New Testament, it shows up uh, 48 times, I believe, depending on which translation you're reading. And it's there as uh, a reference to a place of retreat, uh, an escape from the crowds, where you go when your situation is strange and when your thoughts cannot be contained by the city. So in that same New Testament, when Jesus told his disciples, get thee to a desert place and rest a while, he was not talking about rainfall. He didn't mean you know, Scottsdale or Las Vegas. It was the lack of people that was the point, the lack of civilization. That's why you go to meditate in the wilderness if you have the chance. That's why you, you spend 40 days and 40 nights testing yourself against the wilds in a battle of wits with nature, with the devil, with whatever you bring out there with you. In the ancient world, wolves and bears and the majestic lions ruled the wild places. To walk alone into the wilderness required a determined soul. Hermits 
lunatics, criminals on the run, holy fools. These were the solo travelers of the ancient desert. They lived outside of law. They lived outside the bounds of civilization. And the desert as wilderness has always been the place that is the last refuge of those who cannot follow the, the rules of society. Like Charles Manson, um, who's usually brought up alongside Jesus and Poncho. Uh, Charles Manson's idea about the desert very much came from the romantic imagination of, of writers of Westerns in, uh, in California, especially. When he was in prison in the Bay Area, he watched a lot of TV, as people do when they're in jail. And he saw a show called Death Valley Days. Now, when I was a, a kid a long time ago, Death Valley Days was mostly remembered as being the the last starring television role of, uh, of Ronald Reagan, who was president for most of the, the 1980s. And so people would you know, joke about it like uh, um, it was a bad gig. It was a very good gig. Everybody wanted to be the, the host of a popular show. One of their episodes based on an anecdote from the book Death Valley Days, which was put together by uh, uh, Borkley, a Death Valley writer, was about an underground civilization, a lost underground civilization and found under Death Valley. A couple of miners in the 1930s, the story went, they were looking for gold or looking for silver, and they slipped as they were trying to get up uh, an alluvial hill and they fell into a hole and they found these tunnels. They found these vast tunnels. And as they walked down through the tunnels, they started finding uh, what one of the miners called the implements of the civilization. So there were all sorts of weapons, armor, and they also claim they found Ice Age animals, mummified, uh, saber-toothed cats, dire wolves. Then they got to a final chamber, which they described as being about 100 feet long with windows cut into the rock. And they could look out of those windows from the Panamint Mountains, which they would have been within at this point, they could look down on Death Valley and see the green of Furnace Creek, which is where the hotel and campground and, and now golf course is. And, and they left with plans to, of course, get rich off this great discovery. So they went to the Autry Museum in Los Angeles, uh, which was in the Southwest Museum. And they said, well, a number of years ago, we came across this place. We've been keeping it secret. It's worth a fortune. We'll sell you the information for $5 million. And that museum said no. And then the Smithsonian Institution said no. So they had nothing left to do but hire a publicist who gave a speech at a uh, lunch club where they had civic speakers in Los Angeles. And so the Los Angeles Times and many other papers around the country wrote about this lost civilization. And the last chamber, they described a long table. And sitting around the table, they claimed, were all men, very tall men, dressed in armor and fine leather garments, and holding spears, and the spears were made of pure gold. They were ceremonial spears. The newspaper articles came and went, and the lost civilization was never discovered. 
but Charles Manson remembered the story. So a couple of years later, when he was planning the apocalyptic race war that would lead to the end of the world, and uh, he and his family would emerge and rule what was left of Earth, he said, I'll take the family into these underground chambers under Death Valley, and we'll have everything we need. Because he had sort of added his own elements as he spoke to his followers. He said that there was a, a tree of good and evil, and there were 12 trees trees around it and those trees each bloomed and provided all the food and nutrients that they needed one month at a time going around and so he uh, uh, he encouraged his followers to dive into hot springs north of death valley to find the opening to the the secret world and they would come out scalded from the hot springs and say hardly there's no there's no hole down there I need to tell him, keep trying, keep trying. So eventually, they, uh, did anyone see the, the popular Charles Manson movie that came out before the pandemic? One of you. It was like a reimagining of the story by, by uh, Once Upon a Time in uh, Hollywood. Uh, that movie kind of changed the ending of the story. And if, and I don't advise doing this, but unless you're kind of a fanatic about the Manson murders and there's a whole industry dedicated to it. Um, there've been, I think three or four Manson books in the last couple of years, including one called chaos. Um, What happened to the Manson family is they really did go to Death Valley. They could not find the underground world that he had imagined and built into this place that would welcome them after their terrible crime spree. So they were just hanging out at an old ranch that they rented called Barker Ranch in the Panamint Mountains on the other side of where the secret civilization was supposed to be. And they got bored. So instead of uh, planning their terrible new world, they started going out and vandalizing national park signs and stealing dune buggies. This is how they got caught. The National Park Law Enforcement, the California Highway Patrol, and Indio County Sheriff's deputies raided the place because they'd been stealing dune buggies and vandalizing national park signs. They came in rounded up the hippies, put them in the car. One of the cops said, I'm going to make one more run and look. And he looked and under a cabinet in the bathroom, under the bathroom sink, they found Charles Manson, who they had no idea who he was. So they pulled him out of there and they put him all in the jail in Inyo County in Independence. And a prosecutor driving up from Los Angeles with the LA Times had a picture of Charles Manson on it. It was the first time he had been identified. So that was the end of their uh, adventure under the earth. But it shows how fictions about the desert mixed with legends, they get recycled into Westerns. They get seen by a small time criminal who wants to become a cult leader when he's in jail. And suddenly the lives of so many people are affected. The American desert includes towering mountains, forests of pinion, and juniper and Joshua trees, raging seasonal rivers, dry alkaline lake beds, and badlands of dead end canyons and thorny scrub brush. Right now, the American desert is the greenest that I've seen it in 40 years when I first started exploring the Mojave on my own uh, during the wild El Nino winters of the early 1980s. There's plenty of life there if you're looking for it. 
And then there are places like that where there's not a whole lot. We'll advance here. This is probably an Airbnb now. I took this a couple of years ago uh, outside of Amboy. What the desert lacks, what makes the wild parts wild, what makes it loom so large in the imagination of people around the world is a bare minimum of people. Uh, of course, it's easier to get out to the wilderness today with interstates and cell phones service and water supplies. But once you're out beyond the crowds, beyond the traffic jams and Anza Borrego and Joshua Tree that come with a big wildflower bloom, it's just you. And if you take off your headphones or your AirPods or whatever, it might just want to have a talk with you. If you're alone and you've come looking for a talk. If you listen too long, you might go crazy and never come back. If you listen just enough, you might become a famous artist like Georgia O'Keeffe, who it should be said spent more time walking the desert than painting it. That's what she did. She walked the desert miles and miles and miles, hours and hours every day in New Mexico. Because you can't paint it until it's in you. Since we're in the philosophy department, I'm going to read a little chapter here called Philosophy on the Rocks. What did Mojave pioneers do with their spare time in the days before satellite TV and cell phones? They thought about the big questions about humanity and nature and the point of it all. And in the peculiar case of an immigrant from Sweden named John Samuelson, these thoughts were carved into a series of split boulders around his homestead in Lost Horse Valley now a popular part of Joshua Tree National Park. It was 1926 when Samuelson showed up at Bill Key's ranch looking for work. Hard labor awaited on Key's gold claims. By 1927, the Swede had settled down with his wife, Margaret, on a nice patch of desert in the hills, a few miles northwest of Quail Springs. When he wasn't mining his own claims or tending to the daily needs of a desert homesteader, Samuelson worked on his common sense nature based philosophy, which he forever preserved on a group of eight boulders, give or take some smaller rocks with lesser markings. The Perry Mason creator and pulp author, Eric Stanley Gardner, was just a desert loving Los Angeles attorney with a dream of becoming a crime story writer when he met Samuelson at the Springs by chance during a backcountry outing. Gardner served up a couple of cocktails and paid $20 for the rights to Samuelson's ridiculous and likely fictional life story. Featuring tragedy and magic and shipwrecks and movie style escapes from Cape Town gangsters and African tribes, Gardner's action adventure tale of a Swedish desert rat was published by Argosy Magazine and later found its way into a racist pamphlet that used the unlikely story as propaganda for eugenics, which was very popular at the time. But Samuelson's life had much more drama to come. Having lost his mining claims in court, he headed to Los Angeles, feeling robbed of the desert home he so loved, where he could linger on moral philosophy rather than his fellow man. On a grim honky-tonk night in 1929, a dance hall brawl in Compton left two men dead. The accused killer was John Samuelson, who was pronounced insane and sent to the state prison hospital in Mendocino, but he escaped a year later. Nobody ever saw him in California again as he managed to disappear into the Pacific Northwest, 
and worked for more than two decades at logging camps on the edge of civilization. Bill Keyes, who owned the ranch, tells of receiving a letter from his former employee and neighbor in 1954, a quarter century after the dance hall killings. Samuelson made clear his longing for his desert homestead, but knew he could never return without facing justice. A logging accident took John Samuelson's life a year later, and he might have been forgotten if not for the curious messages branded in the rocks around his old home. The land remained private over the generations, an island or inholding within Joshua Tree National Park. Left off the National Park Service hiking trail maps, yet known to those who seek out of the way spots. In the summer of 2017, the homestead was purchased by the Mojave Desert Land Trust and is on its way to becoming part of the national park. More than 160 such inholdings have been acquired and protected by the Joshua Tree Base Land Trust. To visit these curious relics, go to the Quail Springs picnic area and walk the dry wash for two and a half miles west-northwest. It's a fairly easy morning hike, five miles total, but carry water and tell somebody where you're going. He remains the only philosopher uh, who was noted by Joshua Tree National Park. And I guess to not ruin the vibe, they don't say anything about his... Uh, insanity plea and double murder. <laughs> oh, this picture is real, I'm pretty sure. Uh, this is a picture that went around for a long time. Uh, uh, it was supposedly an interrogation video made with a space alien uh, not under Area 51, but under the mythical Dulce alien base in New Mexico. He got a nickname in the UFO world, uh, Skinny Bob. Have you ever driven uh, to Vegas, anyone? You know that road that no one can decide how to pronounce that you pass? It's actually pronounced Zizek's. This is Zizek Spring. It's beautiful. Uh, it's owned by the California State University system now. It was built by another imaginative philosopher of the desert. who went by the name Doc Springer. His doctorate was, uh, no one knows where it came from. I like to tell about Doc Springer because uh, one is a interesting part of desert history. Um, it showed what you could do at a time when there was very little law in the open desert. The land was technically United States government land, this land here, all around the I-15. But you could get a mining claim. Dr. Curtis Springer got a mining claim and built an entire health resort. And it was basically uh, like, uh, What's her name who did the ski trial just now? Gwyneth Paltrow. It's like Gwyneth Paltrow's company, uh, Goop. He had all these things made out of like minerals, and salts and things that you could buy in little bags. And they would cure you of baldness and bring your vitality back. And the way he built it, well, I'll read just a little bit of this. He was on the radio and he was on the radio all over California. And what he was telling people was to come out and see him. So he'd buy radio time, 15 minutes. That was his usual show. So he was on KFI out of Los Angeles for a long time. 
And he'd say, hello, folks, this is your old friend Curtis Springer coming to you direct from our beautiful new studios located at Zizek's Community Church on the shores of beautiful Lake Tuinde. And as founder and pastor of our church, I want to invite you and your loved ones to come worship with us. Come with or without money and spend a day or a week or a lifetime as you care to and enjoy our beautiful 12,000 acre estate that belongs to God and the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, it turned out. We have no promotion, no real estate for sale. Just come on out here and enjoy our wonderful hot mineral water baths, the finest of foods in abundance, our wonderful desert pure fresh air, no smog, no fog. Come and learn to breathe again. Lay out in the sunshine. Oh, you'll love it here. You'll get a greater joy out of life. So until the same time tomorrow, over the same wonderful radio station, I'll say bye-bye and God bless you all. That was Reverend Dr. Curtis Springer, preserved in recordings that for a long time you could listen to at Kelso Depot in Mojave National Preserve. They're not there anymore. I don't know what happened. Uh, his radio station is still there, though, in the buildings right behind this. This was from KMTR, 570 AM in 1944. Carter Springer made a his uh, he he had oh I got to see the name of this he had a name uh, uh, for a baldness cure that was called uh, Mo Hair Grow <laughs> and it was made of the salts from the playa the dry lake behind there and what you were supposed to do is hang upside down and rub it on your scalp while meditating. I don't know if it worked. What eventually happened to Reverend Springer is after 44 to 76, 32 years, finally the federal police came out and arrested him and took him away and he served a few months. He was old by then and then he came out and his his uh his world his world was gone the way he built it was he'd bring a bus to skid row in los angeles and come out he was a great salesman and he'd say come on you know we pay good wages room and board da 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 and so the winos would get on the bus they'd come out but he was against alcohol so after a few days in the middle of the desert some of them would start walking back and others would take a bus back. And so he had this workforce that would come in, make a little money, and then leave and warn everybody else. So the craftsmanship is not beautiful at the place, but it's probably better than a, a modern strip mall. And it's still standing today, although this is not a picture of it. Let's see if we have one. Oh, this is an old uh, military surplus place outside of Los Alamos. It's called a black hole because that's that's what the bomb would leave. Oh, and there's a friend. <laughs> I'll leave it there for a while. You never know what kind of free toys you'll find in the desert. I found this baby doll out in Wonder Valley um, and I, I left it there, so it may still be there. Mary Hunter Austin is one of the desert visionaries that unfortunately isn't better known. Hopefully you've heard something about her in the course of uh, these these desert studies at the western edge of the great basin beneath the wild and jagged wall of the sierra nevada mary hunter austin spent years among the paiute tribes and pocket miners of owens valley she conversed with the corvids and walked endless miles through shimmering heat she gave into it completely becoming as mystic as the people who lived around her and as natives who reluctantly told their tales to this strange young woman from the flatlands of Illinois. Quote, 
after a time, you get to the point of view of gods about these things to save you from being too pitiful. This she wrote in her 1903 classic, The Land of Little Rain. The epiphanies of Austin are of a color and depth unknown to our age of Instagram banalities about Joshua trees. This is how she wrote about Joshua trees. Tormented, thin forest of it stalked drearily in the high mesas. The yucca, the yucca bristles with bayonet pointed leaves, dull green growing shaggy with age, tipped with fetid greenish blooms. After their death, which is slow, the ghostly hollow network of its woody skeleton with hardly the power to rot makes the moonlight fearful. The somber acknowledgement of the desert's brutality is the desert mystic's special burden. It's what creates its bittersweet sense of eternity. Whatever magic one encountered is littered with death. The divine is aware, but indifferent. From the age of five, Austin had frequent visions, religious visions. And, and she conversed with an entity that she called the I Mary, which was I Mary, who she credited as the author of her trance writings, which were many. The home that she designed in Independence, California, a tiny 19th century town on Highway 395, is a historic landmark today. The surname Austin was the result of her marriage, which ended in 1905, when she moved to the Bohemian colony of Carmel by the Sea, while her husband, Stafford Wallace Austin, went to Death Valley. Looming over the town of Independence is the Sierra Peak that now bears her name part of the rugged John Muir wilderness. But the paradise of Carmel could not keep Austin from the desert. She went back again and again to Death Valley, to Nevada, to Utah, and she wound up in Taos, New Mexico, that ancient Pueblo center that has long drawn the world's mystics. And in 1930, published in collaboration with Ansel Adams, her last major work, Taos Pueblo, is prized especially for uh, Ansel Adams' eerie monolithic photos, which look very modern. Now, uh, your professor mentioned Martha Beckett, um, Marta Beckett. Has, have you all been to Death? You've been to Rhyolite. Have you been to Death Valley Junction? So Death Valley Junction is a, um, it's about the, the only buildings, the only settlement you'll see for about 30 minutes coming up Highway 127. I believe Shoshone is the last town that you go through. And as you come down onto this desert plain, it looks like a vision. It looks like a painting. It doesn't look like things look like in the in the real world of of human built environments because it's completely surrounded by a sea of sand and uh brush and there's this sort of spanish style plaza that you see a good 20 minutes before you get there it had been long abandoned before this little story I'm going to tell you. It had previously been um, mining companies used to feel like they needed to do things like provide housing for workers and places for uh, social activity and health and reading rooms and et cetera. So Death Valley Junction started as a borax mining company town. And if you go to Death Valley, for the first time, or again, stop in Death Valley Junction and look around. It's very eerie. It's very strange. And the uh, the person I'm going to tell you about is, is dead, and her ghost haunts the place. This is from the Hermit Ballerina.
In the late 1960s, a ballet dancer named Marta Beckett found herself in the middle of the Mojave Desert to get a tire fixed at the filling station, which was still in operation across the street from this old mining complex. She and her husband had been visiting what was then Death Valley National Monument. And while waiting for repairs at Death Valley Junction, she fell under the spell of this strange bright place. That's a horse there. I guess I did not have a picture of that. I apologize. There's there's one in the book. I'll hold it up in a second. Well, she fell under the spell of this desolate place that was mostly boarded up. And she decided to stay. It was 1967, after all, and free spirits from the cold and dreary Northeast were popping up all over the, the rural West, back to the land away from the turmoil of the poison cities. She peeked into the old community hall and saw in her mind's eye a beautiful theater. She would dance here, she decided, performing her own show. Marta Beckett tracked down the owner of the abandoned Pacific Borax Company town of Death Valley Junction and agreed right then and there to pay $45 a month in rent for the whole place, which needed a lot of work. One issue she needed to address was the lack of neighbors, the lack of an audience. And so she painted the audience over many years on the walls of the meeting hall that she renamed the Amargosa Opera House. These paintings seen up close are mildly terrifying. Marta Beckett's act was unique and a little terrifying itself. She had a creepy clown ballet as the centerpiece. This was a different time. This was a time when people had to act like they were amused or uh, entertained by clowns. It was probably the last of it. There was the last of the, uh, the TV clown shows in the morning for kids. And eventually kids grew up and said that that wasn't fun at all. You know? <laughs> so The leering faces painted on every flat surface added to the show. That's why I liked it. The idea of it anyway. All those years of hanging around Death Valley Junction, and I never once even tried to see her one woman show. The fact is, it would be sold out to tour buses months or even years in advance, especially after it was a National Geographic. Marta Beckett was as weird as they come, and she found a place as creepy as her own imagination. There was this shaggy-haired alleged comedian named Tom who arrived after Marta's husband headed out for good, and Tom was nearly as weird, serving as Marta's shabby master of ceremonies. Despite doing a good business in tourist season and getting all kinds of mainstream media coverage, the place was never maintained, never really repaired. The whole scene was a bit wrong, as would become apparent in later years when Marta Beckett's story went from a charming PBS tale of an eccentric artist to something that was probably lingering around the place all along. Dark secrets. And in her old age, whispered claims of senior abuse that occasionally made the local newspapers. And sketchy characters wrangling over her value and monetary terms. It's a haunted place in a very real sense. Bad things have happened there, odd things. There are tales of babies being buried in the walls. The ghost hunting shows that were popular on cable television a few years ago went out and held their, I don't know what they hold, like battery detectors or something. And the walls said, yes, there's definitely you know, people buried in these walls. At the time that Marta Beckett was there, another desert artist had shown up and he'd gotten a job driving the school bus. 
and it was a long school bus drive. It went from Shoshone to Death Valley Junction into the National Monument, now National Park, to pick up the Ranger and Park staff's kids, came back out again, and then he had a couple hours to kill. So he'd go to the card room and brothel called Ash Meadow Sky Ranch, which was nearby, had a swamp cooler that he could sit under, and he worked on his book. And his book was Desert Solitaire by uh, Edward Abbey, was the writer. Uh, most people know it as a book about Utah, about slick rock country, but it was written and put together and put in a hat box and mailed to a publisher in New York, all in Death Valley. The desert still welcomes the seeker, the mystic, the artist, the romantic, the idiot, Largely the property of the U.S. government around islands of tribal lands, the American desert remains substantially undeveloped once you branch off from the interstates and sunbelt sprawl of Las Vegas and Phoenix, Palm Springs. There are all but abandoned towns in the Great Basin and on the Colorado Plateau that are too far away for vacation rental weekenders. There are vast public lands in every direction. You can get lost there pretty easily on purpose if you want. As water for industrial agriculture and exurban development becomes costlier in this thousand year drought, and as the value of raw desert as a crucial carbon sink becomes better understood in terms of climate change mitigation, the Southwest might stay much the way it is long into the next millennium, which is good news if you're seeking the weird that you can't find when there's Wi Fi fi and lights everywhere if you're seeking god or yucca man who brian mentioned yucca man is uh hasn't been seen in 20 years so i have no recent stories but people are still claiming to see flying saucers they're still claiming to see la llorona and Whatever they figure is out there, it becomes the souvenir of their spiritual journey to the desert. And so you can tell a lot about people from what they remember when they come back from isolation in the desert. And isolation is different than you know going with 10 people and, and being in a line in the wildflower uh, trail queue and uh, going to Pappy and Harriet's and these things that are popular tourist things. You can do that and have all the people around you just like at home. But if you wind up somewhere strange and by yourself, the people who say it's fantastic and that they got to know themselves and new ideas opened in their head, those tend to be the people you want around when there's trouble the people who thought that everybody was trying to kill them. Uh, those people are probably a, a little too nervous. So the truth is the main reason that people die tourists in the desert is they get lost. They didn't bring water and they end up going around in circles until they take a little rest and then their heart stops. Uh, one of the pictures in the gallery here, of Amboy Crater, that's a place where every year for the past four tourist seasons, two tourists have died. It has usually been a couple in their 50s or 60s. They were usually in decent health. They got distracted, they got lost, and that was it. Um, those are fun stories to bring back if they don't involve you or anyone that you went there with. Uh, we should do some discussion, shouldn't we? Since this chair has been glaring at me for an hour at this point. Um, I have no, is there a process? No, oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for tolerating it.
Wonderful. Um, just do people want to come up or should I walk out here or? <laughs> All right, shout away. I never met Art. Uh, you were a listener? Only when I was driving like to Tucson. Yeah, oh, that's the perfect time. Uh, Art Bell was, uh, oh, the coyotes are going there. <laughs> They never stop. It's the prettiest sound in the world. I record them all the time. I have a, a field recorder. And whenever they start going, I kind of creep outside and get up by the fence. I think they like to freak out the cottontail rabbits that live in my backyard. Um, get right up close and kind of scare them out of the holes. So as long as I creep out and kind of set the recorder on the fence, I can get some, some good songs. Art Bell was a late night radio host based out of Pahrump, which is uh, now one of the fastest growing places in the West. Uh, it's still small and rural, but he had a, a broadcast complex. He built his own radio station and a mobile home behind his house because he got so weirded out around people by the time he was 50 or so that he couldn't even come in late at night and go work in the station. So he had this audience of millions, but he did not like being around other people. Uh, there are tales that I hear uh, that when he would go grocery shopping uh, with his wife Ramona, he would wait in the car with the air conditioner on because he was scared of talking to the clerks, you know. So Art Bell uh, quit his show. His show had some of the first stories about uh, the alleged uh, ET uh, UFO programs at Area 51. He also had stories of Bigfoot. He had a wonderful story. A guy used to call in every couple of months from somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. And this guy claimed he had a pit behind his house and that it was endless and eventually the story developed it went to hell you know and and he would throw things in it and he'd put ropes into it and everything uh so i never met art bell i do know his weekend host george knapp who is still on tv in las vegas uh and who still does the show on sunday nights a couple of times a month they put another guy on the weeknight show and he just works out of a studio in Los Angeles and it lost the magic. But, yeah. He, he kept having, he, he kept having issues. Uh, he would, he would one time, one time, uh, and if there's a, there's a, a short chapter in the book about him, but his story is, much much denser and stranger he would say like there's shadow people hanging around his his trailer where he was doing the radio show and these were being sent by government forces so he needed to take some time off so they'd have to fill in so after he did that several times between 1999 and 2006 i think they said we're gonna go ahead and replace you with someone who comes to the office like they did with a lot of people after the pandemic. You have to come in now because he was kind of off the grid, uh, but he was a great entertainer. On a lot of AM stations to this day, on Saturday nights, they run a repeat of, uh, I think it's called Somewhere in Time. Um, and it's classic old Art Bell episodes. And they're, they're funny, but as soon as you're laughing at them, especially if you're listening alone in the car late at night, then they drop something 
disturbing and then, and then it's not funny anymore. It's a great effect. Um, oh yeah, yeah. He was a conspiracy theories uh, from the the ones that that are part of normal discourse. You know the. They, like they always had stuff about labs and viruses and things like that. And then the, the ones that were just pure fun, like uh, uh, the, the, the aliens eating. And there was an alien who ate ice cream. Uh, uh, someone called and said, uh, Art, I, I escaped from the program. Uh, I'm living in Mexico, I think he said. And there was an alien that survived Roswell and it loved strawberry ice cream. That kind of the kind of detail it's sticking with you. Yes. So you know the uh, novel about the man who fell from the earth. I do, I do, which was not originally in New Mexico, based in New Mexico, right? I thought it was. Uh, the uh yeah, 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 yeah. Which was uh, which? Uh, Nicholas Rogue is that the director? Made the movie with David Bowie as uh, the as the alien, and and a, it's a it's a terrific movie. Um, it's I think Criterion uh, put out a nice version of it in the last year or so, uh, sometime following David Bowie's death. Really? Oh, how fantastic. Did you keep in touch with him? But I mean, after he went on to... Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. Also, I'm just wondering, do you know about the artist, uh, Olaf Dick Horton? No. Oh, because when you got the stand-up for some of the screens, I think it's the first thing on my desktop. I mean, it's a stand made up a lot of sense. It's really kind of impressive. And uh, he had it out as well as his art. No kidding. Is it a newer museum? What's that? Is it a newer museum? I'm I'm actually driving out that way yeah. tomorrow. Maybe I'll go. Right in downtown, right in the yeah. Um, they're, they're, uh, does anyone know what, what we're talking about? El Cajon? Right, right. Have, have to follow that the Andy Rooney system. As, as soon as you hear the prices are going up, destroy the rest of the copies. El Cajon is the home to uh, something I've yet to do a show or write about, although it was something I was personally involved in. Um, there is a religion called your your is your you 
It's not Unarian. It's it's a you you know. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was a husband and wife from Los Angeles from the the New Age spiritualist movement in the fifties. The husband passed on, uh, and then a angel inhabited the body of the surviving uh, member of the couple who called herself the Archangel Uriel. And they bought some desert land out by uh, Boulevard, uh, out on uh, 94 near the Mexican border, about an hour and a half from here, and built a flying saucer landing pad. And you know they took a bulldozer in a circle. And that's where it was going to be. And they went out to meet it when it was going to come. So late at night in the 1980s, on what was called cable access, you could watch their homemade science fiction movies that illustrated these stories that she had channeled from the husband who had passed on and went back to the planet of the stars or whatever. So my first job as a kid, I worked at a ice cream diner parlor called Farrell's and the entire staff, except for the dishwashers, which is what I was at age 14 and a half or whatever I was at the time, uh, were members of this uh, cult. And so they had to wear normal clothes, but at night you could turn on TV and see them dressed in their splendor. They had sparkling robes and headdresses and kind of a Star Trek set. It was uh, very beautiful. Yes. Um, he's kind of canceled now. So, you know, in a lot of circles, um, which I've been told in recent years, I, you know, I just remember reading his work when I was a kid and, um, Edward Abbey was the author of, of desert solitaire, which has been part of the class, I imagine. He and and he, he was uh, he actually had a a, a doctorate of philosophy, um, which he kind of downplayed through life. He liked to uh, fool people that he was his country boy, you know. But he was he was a, a smart character, and he also claimed to be an anarchist, even though he spent his entire life chasing one government short-term job after another. So he's a little bit of a hypocrite, but people got to eat. He had kids to feed lots of them. Um, I think he married five times and had children in most of those marriages and was living as a, you know, uh, freelance writer and part-time park ranger. Uh, so he, he, I think that he was the best writer about the American Southwest uh, of, of the 20th century. You know, there's other people who are probably more respected. Um, Mary Hunter Austin is very well respected. Um, he's, he, he was a, a he liked to make trouble more than than win acceptance i think so uh i was thinking about him today because i remembered that about 40 years ago i went to see him speak at ucsd one of his rare public appearances towards the end, uh, end of his life um he had won some grant or something and they got him to come out and speak. And so I was one of the sunburnt kids with backpacks that would go you know, see him and bring up a bunch of dirty old paperbacks and not, you know, uh, uh, just one hit, you know, want signatures and we didn't have phones with cameras. So I didn't get a picture of him. Um, but it, it was it was it was interesting to meet him. Uh, it was interesting to see the the real person 
because he was, uh, his literary character was fantastic. You know, if you believed his literary character, he hadn't been sober in decades. Uh, he was constantly driving around, shooting stuff out the window of his pickup truck. And yet he was you know, this well-behaved uh, academic. So, But I encourage people to read him, even if you, even if you hear online that he's canceled because he's uh, uh, a terrific writer. And he, I, I don't even know what he's canceled for. But I've been told so many times by conservation people you know, land conservation people are, uh, they're always worried about crossing some line and getting into trouble and losing funding. So they're very cautious. Anybody else? Well, thank you all so much. I appreciate uh, you uh, indulging uh, me. Uh, and this is a subject obviously that that i love sort of to the exclusion of of anything else um and i i do try to stress that especially now that the the desert is is popular as a, a weekend vacation sort of thing the the place i live 20 years ago i was driving with a, a bureau of land management manager for that area senior California state executive for the federal Bureau of land management. And we were going through wonder Valley and I was saying, you know, it's kind of a shame. The County has knocked down so many of these little cabins out here. Cause they were being used for meth mostly, you know, they were abandoned. So you could load up your ingredients, go cook meth. And if you made a mistake and the cabin blew up, which happened often, there was no vegetation around to catch fire so it was kind of a, a contained event and i said this this area is so beautiful and it's kind of run down the county doesn't know what to do with it and he looked at me and he's like no one will ever care about this place except meth dealers and now we just had a big event in wonder valley where everybody showed up for miles around to fight off uh, a uh, uh, luxury health spa that was going to be called the Wonder Inn. It was going to be built right there, surrounded by those cabins. All the surrounding cabins have been turned into very expensive modernist Airbnbs. So um, perceptions of a place change. We're lucky that all that land around Southern California civilization is pretty much protected for good. Um, there are scares sometimes. There, are, uh, we had industrial solar a couple of years ago, which was an issue because renewable energy is good, but it's not good to bulldoze wilderness and endangered species and et cetera. So it, things go back and forth, but the idea of the desert being a place that should challenge you mentally, spiritually, that should make you question what you're doing in life. Um, I think that should be preserved. That should be attempted. And obviously if you're going out for like a bachelor party or something, that's, it's not going to happen that time, but um, there's, there's nothing better than being, alone with a hundred miles of horizon and nothing in that hundred miles around you that cares at all. If you live or die, you know, it's, uh, it's invigorating. So thank you all.